Uh, my name is Paul Sylvester. I'm the moderator for this session uh, on mineral analysis. We proposed this session because obviously uh, uh, the determining the chemical isotopic composition of minerals has played a major role in, uh, in the MSA and mineral sciences for many years. And uh, we wanted to take uh, stock of that now, see where we've been and where we're going. So um, we have two uh, experts in two of the techniques that play a major role in in situ mineral analyses. That is uh, ion microprobe and laser ablation ICPMS. So I've asked them both to uh, speak to these, their the technologies, but with reference to uh, electron probe analyses and associated uh, other uh, techniques for in situ analyses. So we're, we're going to uh, hear about where they think things are going and where improvements can be made. But one of the reasons we wanted to do this at the MSA is we would like to get some feedback from an audience of MSA uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, colleagues about where the community really thinks developments can go. Because the, the, truly, these, these analytical tools can be developed, in, and, and you'll see in a second when you hear these talks, in, a, in, a, in a quite a variety of ways. Um, and, and unlike a lot of other fields, these two particular instruments have been developed largely by geologic input. Uh, major, um, the, the companies really are responsive to the geologic uh, community. So we. The discussion afterwards will be focused on where do you think the, the most important science can be done with the improvements that, uh, that uh, the speakers are going to suggest that can be made. So our first speaker is going to be Mike Wiedenbeck. His uh, talk is going to be on the, uh, mostly focused on the ion microprobe. He's at a, um, uh, the Hemholtz Institute in Potsdam, Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing the session and uh, inviting me here and uh, helping me get here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a technique called laser ablation ICP, ICPMS, and I'm going to try and show you how we can apply it to saying a lot about how minerals form. So for those of you who are not familiar with how a laser ablation system works, uh, in its simplest form, it uh, consists of a pulsed uh, ultraviolet laser that you steer and focus onto a sample. Uh, and at the focal point of the laser, you basically vaporize the sample. You remove material as a vapor. It rapidly condenses to particles. And those particles are then flushed in a continuous flow of helium uh, to an ICPMS. There are all sorts of different types of ICPMS, but the this one here is something we call a quadrupole ICPMS, so these particles of sample go into a, an, an 8 to 10,000 degree ICP. They get volatilized, converted to atoms and ions, and those ions are then extracted through an interface uh, into a mass spectrometer. They're focused with some ion lenses, uh, and then the ions are separated on their mass-to-charge ratio uh, by, in this case, uh, something we call a quadrupole uh, mass spectrometer, and then the number of ions of each different element are counted in a detector. Um, most ICPMS is a single detector instrument, so you have to switch the voltages on these uh, quads to, to let each ion of different mass through to the detector, and you measure them sequentially. And those counts are then uh, basically sent to a computer for data processing. And the beauty of this technique is it's very flexible. You can analyze almost any sort of sample with very little sample preparation. You can analyze thin sections, polished blocks, grain mounts. As long as you can fit it into the cell, basically, you can analyze it. So what are the attributes of this technique? Well, you can analyze uh, a very large number of elements. We, uh, you can analyze most of the elements in the periodic table, except for a few uh, light elements, I'll talk about that later. We typically analyze 50 elements uh, or so simultaneously. Uh, and unlike the, the iron microprobe, it is relatively matrix insensitive, which means that we can calibrate it uh, usually just with a synthetic glass uh, and then employing an internal standard to correct for the amount of material that's actually ablated relative to the standard. Internal standard being a an element in the sample whose concentration we already know, a major element typically. Um, whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong one. How do I go back? 
Uh, where are we? Okay. Spot sizes are very variable depending on the application. You can go as small as about four microns up to 100 microns or more. And it's a very sensitive technique, uh, detection limits for most elements, as, as certainly the heavier elements, typically in the PPM down to low or even sub PPB levels. Fairly accurate and, and precise at about 5% for the better elements. And it's pretty fast. So a typical analysis is around about a minute. And um, the sort of precisions you can expect, oh, sorry, uh, you, because we're also using a mass spectrometer, uh, you can measure isotope ratios with precisions which, depending on the type of mass spec, may vary from uh, percent levels even down to PPM levels. So what are some of the things we can do with this technique? Well, one of the things we can do is because we acquire data very rapidly as the laser is penetrating down into the sample, we can do depth profiling, and here's a a depth profile of uh, ablation of lutetium concentration in a, in a strongly zoned garnet. Uh, and we can also use these time-resolved uh, spectra, so signal against time, uh, to say something about where the elements are in a mineral. So here we have a phlogopite. You can see the signals for titanium, strontium, niobium are all tracking along, telling us that those elements are substituted into the crystal lattice. But you see the cerium is dancing about here by a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, and that's telling us that the cerium is not uh, substituted into the lattice at all. In fact, in this case, this is cerium sitting on the major cleavage planes in the phlogopite. So each time we ablated through a major cleavage plane, the cerium leapt up. We can also use it to uh, do fluid inclusion analysis. We can open single fluid inclusions and get these very short transient signals just here, as you can see, a, a second or two, but get nice signals from the fluid inclusions. And as I've already mentioned, because we're using a mass spectrometer, we can also do things like lead uranium dating, and we can do a reasonably good job of uh, uh, uranium lead dating with sort of accuracies and precisions of a few percent. We can also do... Nowadays, clever things like this, where we actually take the laser aerosol and we split it between two machines, two different, different types of ICPMS. So we're getting two types of, ice, of data on the, the same ablation volume. So here, we've taken the uh, aerosol, we've split some of it into, a, uh, into what we call a multi-collector ICPMS. This is a double-focusing uh, ICPMS with multiple detectors. So we're measuring all the different isotopes we're interested in simultaneously. And by doing that, we can improve the precision of the isotope ratio by a factor of 10 to 100 or so, which allows us to measure radiogenic isotopes like hafnium. And we've started doing things like copper isotopes and iron isotopes uh, using this same technology. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong one again. Um, and then we send the rest of the aerosol into a, into a single collector instrument where we can measure trace elements, uranium lead date. So on the same ablation volume, we can measure high precision isotope ratios, and we can also measure trace elements and uranium lead dates uh, if we are analyzing something like a zircon. And this technology has opened up a field that we're becoming known as petrochronology. So just very quickly on the right here, this is the sort of data you can get so by analyzing zircons for their trace elements, their uranium lead ages, and hafnium isotopes, you can say something. You can collect detrital zircons from a stream sediment uh, and, say, and almost piece together the, the sort of tectono-magmatic uh, history of the drainage basin based on the, those different types of information. The area that I think, and certainly in our laboratory is at is literally game-changing, uh, is the ability of this technique to rapidly generate trace element maps of minerals. So two-dimensional element concentration maps. And I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk uh, just describing this. So there's two ways you can do this. You can either blanket the area of interest uh, in, a, in a series of, of square ablations, and eventually each one of these spots becomes a pixel in your map, or more commonly, what we do is we actually scan the laser. Well, we don't actually scan the laser. We keep the laser, but we, we move the sample underneath the fixed laser. And like an old cathode ray tube, we basically cover the uh, entire area that we're interested in 
uh, in a line of uh, ablations, collecting data as we go. And we can then start putting this data together and generating some very interesting uh, two-dimensional maps. And I'm just going to use a few examples here just to show you how incredibly complex uh, most minerals, and I'll say most minerals are, when you start really looking at them in uh, at the sort of micro scale. So for over here on the left, uh, where I have a sphalerite grain. Sorry, the, uh, the, uh, uh, this is some work that we're doing with a gentleman named Well Shen Li on some sphalerite. Um, but anyway, it's a sphalerite. And I just want to show you this incredible complexity of the different ways that different elements have behaved here. So the indium, uh, you can see, is beautifully correlated with the zoning in. The silver is exactly the opposite. All the silver is located in fractures through this grain, most of which you cannot even see. And then the copper is somewhere in between. Some of the copper is controlled by the, by the zoning, and some of it is in fractures. The point here is that if you were trying to to look at this grain with a few spot analyses, there is no way on earth that you would have sort of unraveled this complexity. The only way to unravel this sort of complexity is through, through this uh, mapping approach. Here's another beautiful example that uh, we did recently. This is a, uh, uh, from a sulfide horizon in a layered mafic intrusion, uh, pyrotite, uh, pentlandite, calcopyrite. Here's the cobalt map, and it, picking out the three main phases rather beautifully, but then when you look at the arsenic and molybdenum, you can see that they're entirely controlled by some sort of structure running through this sample that really, for the most part, you cannot see down the microscope. So we assume that this is some sort of deformation slip. We, we don't know for sure, but some sort of deformation fabric that fluids have, have uh, infiltrated along. And again, if you were analyzing this with a few spots, depending on where you put your spot, you would get an entirely different result that you would have no idea what it meant uh, without this ability to visualize it in two dimensions. This is some EBSD work we did. But the most valuable part about this, uh, two, di this two dimensional mapping is the way that you can actually start to to get, get the maps to give you some sort of chemical history of a sample. So this is a really nice example. This is from a gold deposit. This is a, uh, some pyrite. It looks very simple mineralogically. It's pyrite and siderite. It looks incredibly simple until you look at the trace element maps for that pyrite and siderite. And I don't have time to go through this in any great detail, but if we just concentrate on nickel here, you can very soon pick out the fact that there were probably five episodes of pyrite deposition. Just So we start with this low nickel pyrite here, then this big crystal started to grow. It, it initially had high nickel, high arsenic, then we have a low nickel band, then we have a high nickel band, and eventually we go out into this fine grain pyrite. This is, this is uh, pyrite number five. And you can see that there's two, two episodes of gold deposition, one in the core here, and one associated with this late fine pyrite. And you can even see a little gold uh, a, fract a, a gold enriched fracture of the second uh, gold introduction event uh, cross cutting the first one. So it's a beautiful example of how, based on these maps, you can start to piece together a sort of chemical history of the, of the way this sample formed. So, for the rest of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about where I think this technology is going. How am I doing for time, Paul? Oh, not good. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to skip, we're going to, as a lot of people have done, we're going to go into high speed mode now. So this map, this diagram basically shows uh, uh, the, how the sensitivity of these instruments have evolved over the years. This is one of the first ICPMSs ever delivered, a solution sensitivity of just 100,000 counts per second per ppm. Within a year, it had gone to a million. Over the next uh, 10 years, instruments improved by a factor of about 500 in their sensitivity. And since then, even the most sensitive ICPMSs are barely any more sensitive than they were 25 years ago. So it seems like in terms of sensitivity, we have somewhat stalled, even though we probably have at least a couple more orders of magnitude sensitivity we could gain. Uh, but, 
But at least for now, it seems like we've hit some sort of wall in terms of sensitivity. What we have done, however, is started to um, introduce new types of ICPMS. This is a, a fairly recently introduced instrument called a triple quad ICPMS, which has this incredible ability to separate some of these interferences that have plagued us over the years. And it's really opened up this uh, field of beta decay geochronology. So for instance, we can analyze uh, strontium isotopes now using this thing and remove the rubidium uh, 87 interference on strontium 87 by essentially reacting the strontium with nitrogen gas in a cell. So we're actually reacting the gas with the ions as they come through the machines. Uh, the rubidium doesn't react, so you set the second quadrupole here to mass 103, which allows strontium through as strontium oxide, gets rid of the rubidium, and now you can measure your strontium isotope ratios, and that's allowing some very, very good uh, rubidium-strontium uh, isochron work to, to, for the first time, and m quite recently, rhenium-osmium has been demonstrated using the same technique. Um, I'm just, I'll skip this one in... Uh, so where I think the technique is really going uh, is, in, is speed. This, the big drive now seems to be to speed up this whole technology. Um, this is a, a typical laser ablation cell. This is the signal response from this cell for a single laser shot, and you can see that the, the signal decays over about a second. So if you're firing the laser at 10 shots per second, you essentially would end up with a roughly steady state signal, which is ideal for our slow mass spectrometers. But recently, new uh, sample introduction devices have been generated, which allow us to, to uh, flush these cells in a matter of uh, milliseconds, a few tens of milliseconds, which means you can now fire a laser at 50 shots per second and resolve every single peak. And that's no use for our um, standard uh, uh, sequential instruments, but it is of use if you have a simultaneous instrument, and these have started to come on the market, and the one that seems to be gaining the most traction at the moment is something called a time of flight mass spec, where the ions come through here, they're stored, and then they're accelerated uh, towards the detector, and because the lighter ions uh, are accelerated faster, they come in first, or the heavier ions come in later, so you get these packets of ions coming in at time-resolved differences. And this thing will measure the entire periodic table for you 30,000 times every second. So where does this put us in terms of uh, drawing a line in the sand? Well, this is a, a map that was recently, oops, sorry, 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 uh, published. Um, and it shows uh, some maps produced by this laser ablation time of flight. Uh, this is for a schist. Uh, they're not particularly exciting chemical maps. But uh, I just want you to look at these numbers here. So each pixel here is five microns. They were measuring 100 pixels per second using this technology, a total of a million pixels, which means that you've measured the entire periodic table on a million pixels in five hours. That means that they ended up in five hours with more than 50 million elemental concentrations. 50 million in a few hours, which is uh, unbelievable. Now you're going to kick me off now, Paul, or am I? Two minutes, OK. Um, so I'm just going to finish the, f f flick through the last couple of slides. So of course what this now opens up is now we've got this massive amount of data that we can generate in a matter of hours. How, how are we using it? And of course this is where modern software comes into play and they're now developing uh, some very, very clever software that allow you to go into these elemental maps and interrogate them. For instance, this is the Monocle software. You can go in, you can pick out a an area of interest, it'll immediately show you histograms, rare earth plots for that particular area, and you can even use it as a seed and, and tell it to go and find all the pixels in this map of similar chemistry and, and give me the chemistry for the, all the similar, similar uh, pixels in these, uh, and tabulate it here and generate plots, uh, etc. cetera. Um, in my lab, we're, we're doing a lot of work on uh, these uh, some pyrite nodules from the Abitibi uh, Greenstone Belt in Canada. Um, 
generating, and we're particularly interested in these because they're extremely gold rich. They have cores which often have all grade levels uh, of gold. And the question is, what do we do with these, uh, these, these beautiful maps that we're generating? Well, the first thing that we would do nowadays is apply some sort of principal component analysis and clustering, and if we take those maps and do this, we find that using these statistics, we can uh, actually draw out the fact that there is six chemically distinct pyrite types in this one nodule. So rather than visually say, oh, well, yes, 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 it looks, that looks different, we can actually statistically pull out six different types chemically distinct pyrite generations in this nodule. And we can then use that predictively. Uh, so we've acquired data on large numbers of pyrites from this area. We've characterized them we've, based on their petrography as to how they probably formed. And we can now use this sort of information predictively. So here's a, a, a pyrite class from a, from a conglomerate. We wanted to know, well, what was the actual genesis of that pyrite class? This is what it looks like, fine-grained pyrite. We've got some bladed pyrite here. We've got some nice euhedral crystal overgrowth, and we've got a fracture running through here. So now using this library of data we have for all these pyrites from this area, we can actually go in and uh, predict what the genesis of that was. And here's the predictive map. It suggests that most of this pyrite was actually diagenetic, that there was a hydrothermal component here, which is not surprising, seeing as it's along the edge of this major fracture. And this euhedral crystalline pyrite around the here outside is metamorphic. So that's just, uh, so I'm going to, I'll just, because I'm out of time, I'll just put that up and you can read it through in your own time. I'm happy to discuss it more as we go.